are in Philippians chapter 3. Continue on with this great book. What an amazing book. I can relate to it so well. Because we can do that with all of God's word. But it's always interesting the way God recorded his word. I find it quite fascinating how he used people over a 1,500-year period, three different languages, three different continents, people from all different walks of life. They wrote down the word of God, and when it was put all together, it all matched. It all blended. There were no contradictions. It all fit together. And the reason why is God's the single author. God was dictating his word to these different people, prophets, sharing the word of God with them of what God was doing in his plan and so forth and purpose. And we have it all right here before us. And we can open the pages of this book and hear from God. He used different personalities as he spoke. There were some prophets that were real, real judgmental, some that were loving and gracious. There were those that were black and white, thus saith the Lord, this is the way you do it or else. There were real, all different kinds of personalities. But it's all God's word. And I look at the example here in, Paul, in Philippians of Paul. Paul was a tenacious, there's a job to do, let's get it done. I don't care what's in the way. And you couldn't stop this man. He just had a, 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 a desire to please God in whatever he was doing. And it didn't matter if there was opposition, ridicule, persecution, whatever. Thrown in prison, beaten. He was even killed one time and brought back to life. And when he got up, he says, let's do it again. <laughs> Some of the other apostles didn't like that. because It was like, oh, man, this guy just never stops. He never quits. He's like the energizer bunny. But that's the way he was. And we read in Galatians, we don't need, don't need the true in there, but in Galatians 1, he says, I was called before I was born by God to do this ministry. And I thought that's pretty neat. How the God, the God that knows the beginning from the end knew about Paul, knew that he would be Saul, the persecutor of Christian, and he would have his heart transformed into a man that God would greatly use to teach God's word. He wrote most of the New Testament. When I say wrote, he, it was dictated to him and he wrote it down. He was a great man of God. And you know, we have that same calling as believers. You and I do. We have the same calling that God has. It says in Ephesians 2.10, it says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has a work for you and me as a believer in Christ, to do. A mission. You were not born at this time by accident. At this particular time in history, we are here for a particular mission and job. And it's up to us to be in the word of God to seek what that is. Because we have to work for God. That's what we were called for. Some people say, well, that's just um, optional. You know, if I want to serve the Lord, I can. If I don't, I'll just sit in the pew and, and, and vegetate. No, it's not. We all have the, the option to obey God. Yes, but we've all got a calling on him. We all don't listen to it sometimes, but it's, it's a special calling. We're here to serve. In the book of Philippians... We see Paul with a burning desire. And we saw this last week. He had a burning desire to know Christ, to make him known, and to have a close fellowship with him that comes through suffering. Ooh, I don't like that word. Suffering. Oh, what do you mean you got to suffer? Well, Jesus says, they hated me, they're going to hate you also. Suffering is not something we enjoy. But I tell you what, when we are going through the struggles, it grows us, it matures us, it makes us closer to God. And Paul says, the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul realized that you know, when I am being persecuted, when I'm going through the struggles, 
Jesus is right there with me, encouraging me, lifting me up, and, and, and strengthening me. And that happens during persecution. He described this relationship as a lifetime growing process, seeking the Lord each day, and we really never fully achieve it until we see Christ face to face. It's a growing relationship. I don't know about you, but I feel like it's a slow growth for me. You know, I, I, sometimes I, I move ahead quite a bit on that relationship, and then other days I fall way behind. and like, oh, Lord. But it, it's a continuous movement forward to get to know Christ a little better each day. And it's a privilege that we have. And so when we get into Philippians here, chapter 3, verse 13 through 17, Paul reminds us, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or obtained, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press, I pursue towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. This mindset, this mindset here of the same mind, it's a singleness of mind. It's in the Greek, good sound thinking. And so what he's telling us to do is, listen, let's forget about what's happened in the past. Your failures. You know, Christ has forgiven them. Why don't you forgive yourself? Ah, there's the caveat. Who calls them to our memory? The enemy, Satan. Oh, you failed again. Boy, you never get it right. Oh, God's mad at you. Oh, you why, don't even bother praying. He's not going to listen to your prayers. Oh, and, and he gives us all these false statements that bring us down and discourage us. I read, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me all my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's my God. So forget about those past failures. Move forward, Paul is saying. But I also think it's talking about don't remember your past success and achievements. Oh, I remember 20 years ago when I was on a missions trip and I, I was able to lead three people to Christ and boy, it was exciting. And there's where you stayed. And since that time, you've never done another thing for God. No, move forward. Achieve more for God. So he's saying, forget those things. Set your mind on sound thinking. On the screen here, I've got... A, I hope that you got a good pen and an empty piece of paper because I've got a ton of verses here that we're going to go through. Now, to make it quicker, I've put them on the screen. And I, 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 it just it just started coming at me when I studied this thing. And when I got done, I said, Lord, I, I don't know if everybody's going to follow me. And he said, they will. They will. It's my word. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Fear comes when I want to serve the Lord. I get those bubbly feelings in my chest like, oh man, I got to share the gospel with them. Oh, what happens if they reject it? And you get this, this scary feeling. Well, God has not given me that. The enemy don't want you speaking. No, 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 no. Don't give them that word. They'll, they'll, they'll change. They'll, they'll, I won't be able to send them to hell. No, 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 no. But God has not given us that spirit of fear, but of power. You and I have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Of a love. It's his love, not mine. It's his love for other people. In the sound mind of is a clear thinking. It all comes from God. God wants us to have that. It's the mature person we see here who realizes they have not arrived Paul says he's not yet attained. That person who has the treadwear. Now, when I say treadwear, it's, it's not necessarily gray hair. There's a lot of gray hair people who have never grown in the Lord. 
Just like there's many gray-haired people that have never gone to physical battle at a war. I can say that I've never been in a war. I was never drafted. I was never in the military. So I do not understand what that was like. And from what I hear from other people, I, I'm not sure that I would want to understand what it was like. Because I've heard some horrific stories. But as far as in the Lord, we need to grow and mature. And the person with treadwear understands, yes, it's worth it. That person has gone through the struggles and the persecutions and the trials and, and the sicknesses and have stayed faithful. They can look at you and say, it's worth it. I like what Pastor Matt says. I never heard anybody say that has trusted Christ as Savior. Oh, I wish I had waited. <laughs> no, it's always the other way. Because it is worth it. It's that person who realizes the more you know, the less you truly understand of this book. It's a big book. But everything we need to know about God is right here. Everything we need to be equipped to work for him. So we grow in it. It's also the mature person who realizes the things of this world do not last. And there is more to life than living for self. How many here were saved later in life? Yeah. Can you look back at your life and say it was worth it? All those things that you did? If it was, you probably wouldn't be saved. You'd be saying, I'll stop, stay there. But no, you, you found something better, Christ. Living for self doesn't satisfy. It's also the mature person who realizes only what is done for Christ will last. And we see that in a book of a famous man who was the wisest man that ever lived. Who was that? Solomon. In the book of Ecclesiastes, a book he also wrote, he experienced everything in life. He partied. He did everything. He traveled. He, he collected wealth. He collected more wives than any human should ever have. <laughs> That's a lot of honeydew lists. But anyways, and at the end of it all, he goes, oh, it was vanity. It was a waste of time. Only what is done for God matters. That was his final conclusion in the book of Ecclesiastes. Only what is done for Christ will last. So in this particular area, Paul is saying, believers, let's be unified. Let's be unified. Following Christ is worth it, and it's something we need to do. Now, it's interesting because Paul was a man who achieved great success. He was going to be the next I believe, high priest of all of Israel. He had received such prominence. He was uh, uh, the head of his class and everything. But here he is, ready to throw it all away to know Christ. So there must be something about knowing Christ that is so much more valuable. And it is. He wanted that relationship with God. And we see over and over again that Scripture, which never, by the way, never changes, is always speaking truth. It tells us that only a life in Christ is all that matters. Everything else is a waste of time. It's dead end. It doesn't satisfy. That extra dollar bill you got isn't going to be enough. It's going to want another one to be alongside of it and another one to be alongside that. And before long, that's all you live for. And when you get done, what do you do with your riches? Give it to somebody else. You can't take it with you. If we're honest with ourselves and we really look seriously at the situation, a self-seeking life never satisfies. And Paul was sharing that. He was letting us know that. Verse 17, he goes on to say, well, let's read 16. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. And then verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note or spy out those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. In this verse, it testifies that there are many others who have come to the same conclusion, that only what's in Christ will last. 
In that verse, we're also encouraged to pattern our lives after those that have found that truth. To look at them and to say, what's making them happy? I'm going to do that. What's giving them joy? I'm going to seek after that. And pattern this, fashion your life after them. It's sort of like the, with the, when it talks about uh, be not conformed to this world in, in, in Romans. It's talking about be in the mold. Be put into the mold of Christ, not the mold of the world. So we're going to mold our life after their life because they're molding their life after Christ. And we're following their example. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, on the screen, it says here, In the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's what true discipleship is. It's taking my life and fashioning after somebody else that's doing what they're supposed to do and then using my life to show others. That's what true discipleship is all about. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, taking other believers alongside of us and saying, hey, let's go out and witness together. Hey, l- let me show you what I'm learning in the word of God. And we share with each other. And what does it do? The Bible says iron sharpens iron. It makes us stronger and more, more like Christ. So we're supposed to be doing those things. We're to follow the great apostle Paul's example and join with him. Now, you might think to yourself, whoa, wait a minute. (laughs) How can I do that? He's the great apostle Paul. I could never attain like him. Oh, yes, we can. Why? The same Holy Spirit that was in him lives in you. The same Holy Spirit. As much Holy Spirit as he had, we have the same amount. What do we have? All of the Holy Spirit is living in each one of God's children. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of me. That's an awesome thought. That's a humbling thought. That same power is inside of you. Well, how does it work? How do I unleash that power? It's sort of like having this powerful tool in my hand and it's got this funny looking brown cord coming out of it with three prongs on it. And you're holding on and you say, well, how do you get power out of this thing? What do I do? Well, you see that spot over on the wall there has the similar three prongs? Plug it in and watch what happens. When we plug in the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, things happen. Things happen. You say, well, how does that work? Well, I've kind of made it very simple here. Maybe too simplistic, but this is the way I see it. First of all, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? This is what unlocks the door of God's power. And what do I mean, have you trusted Christ as Savior? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died and paid for your sins? Have you put your faith and trust in that as the way to heaven? See, all of us have sinned. We've come short of God's glory. All my goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. And so I have to find another way for my sins to be paid for. And the Bible says the only way is through Jesus Christ. He came to earth. He lived the perfect life. He took the sin of the world upon himself, died on a cross, to pay for the price of sin, which is death. And he says, if you will put your faith and trust in that and believe that I've done that for you, it'll get you the eternal life that I offer to you. But as many as receive him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. And when I receive Christ as Savior, something happens to you and me. The Holy Spirit of God comes and lives inside of us. How's that possible? I don't know. I don't understand all that. But I do know the Bible says it's true. He comes and lives inside of you. He unleashes his power in your life so that when you're reading this book, you understand it. Before I trusted Christ as Savior, I remember reading this book, and it was like, fairy tale. I don't understand this. This is weird stuff. And when I received Christ as Savior... All of a sudden, 
light was turned on. And I started to say, that's what that verse means. I see that. Wow, that's what he's doing in my life. Wow, and it came alive. And so the first thing is, is trust Christ as Savior. The second thing, are you reading and hearing what the Word of God is saying? Because that's where the power comes from. And then it comes down to, are you yielding to what it is saying or are you resisting it? And there's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because he speaks in accordance to the Word of God. And when I read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is saying, you see that verse? You see it? You know, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. What, what, what were those words I heard yesterday? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, are you going to change that? Well, oh, are you going to change that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Or if I can say no to that, I'm resisting. And all of a sudden, God's power is being weakened in my life. But as Apostle Paul puts it, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Everything that that book said, he believed it. And that's why he wouldn't stop. Because God told him, you're going to suffer, Paul, but you're my messenger to the Gentiles. And he said, well, if I'm God's messenger, then God, no one's going to be able to kill me until God's done with me. So let's go. And that guy wouldn't stop. He drove everybody crazy. But that's what it means to have the power of God in our life. Well, verses 18 and 19, Paul switches gears. He starts talking about a very sad situation. And this is where I get into a bunch of verses. And if you have pen and paper, you can write down these references. We'll look at them real quickly, but we cannot do justice to it. But uh, these are verses that talk about these verses. Let's look at 17, 18 verse. He says, brethren, fellow believer, join in following my example. And then verse 18, here it goes. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Mm. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. Those that are not following Christ, those that are in contrary to what the Word of God says. And I don't know if you've noticed, if you've been listening, it's getting more and more. Their voice is getting louder and louder. It's getting more deceptive out there in the world. And I wouldn't believe, I, I, maybe it's true, but I, I couldn't believe that they would do this purposely. That they would actually say, I'm going to disobey God if they knew it was God. It'd be kind of foolish for a person to do that. So what's happening? Here we go. Are you ready? Okay. Fasten your spiritual seatbelts. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Verse 3 and 4, it says, But even if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing. And the first thing is the gospel. We said that's the entry point of God's power. Well, it's hidden. How? Okay, it's hidden because it says, Whose minds the God of this age, by the way, that's Satan, the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan has blinded people to say, oh, it can't be just believe in what Jesus did. That would be too simple. you got to work. you got to... And he starts adding things to the gospel, which is not the gospel according to Galatians. It's a counterfeit. It does not work. And so they blinds them from that so that the light of the Holy Spirit coming in their life does not come there so that they do not understand and they are deceived and not following lest the image of God should shine on them. So they're blinded to the truth. They're blinded by Satan. Next verse, Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. 
This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Okay? An unsaved person is a person who doesn't know Christ, and they're walking in this world in something that's vain. It doesn't work. They think it does. They think everything's fine and wonderful until it's not. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. They're actually walking in opposite directions to where God wants them to walk. Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. They're victims of what Satan is trying to do. Just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eve. In the Garden of, in the garden. Garden of Eve, <laughs> Garden of Eden. You know, just like there, hath God said? And he started questioning God's word to Eve, and she started doubting that God was really saying what he said or meant it. And boom, he got her. They're deceived. Look at this. Who mind, the minds of their God, the God of this age, has blinded. Satan is working to deceive. He uh, says he's seeking to devour as many as he can with deception. Wow. Sad place to be. The understanding is darkened. They're blinded from the truth. It's, it's, it, it's sad. It's a mess. Next verse. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk with futility in their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. They're blinded from the truth. But it's not what we've been taught in Christ. And so God is saying, don't be like that. Follow what I say in the principles of my word. Put off the old way of thinking and put on the new that's in Jesus Christ. I was looking at this and I thought, can a believer be an enemy of Christ? A true believer in Christ. Someone that has already trusted him. Well, Let's set down the foundation here first. When I trust Christ as my Savior, Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. I become his child. I belong to him. He seals me with the Holy Spirit of promise, which puts his ownership on me, his mark. And the Bible says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, but, but, but my father which is great in all no one's able to pluck him out of his hand so i'm eternally his i cannot be taken away from god i am secure in jesus christ when i put my trust and faith in christ yet as a christian i can live my life like i am his enemy now that's not being loyal to him it's acting like an unsaved person it's not following the principles of God's word. The results, the results are not pretty. Not pretty at all. I looked at three things I think happened. First of all, you lose the blessing of God in your life. All the promises of God's word, he, he can't bless you when you're living for yourself and not living for God. You end up being a, dis a disciplined child. And I don't know if you, what it was like with you in the physical realm, but I was, when I was disciplined to my, by my father, it was not fun. 
I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't happy. Which brings us to the next point. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no contentment. You're feeling yuck. Because the Holy Spirit is going to dog you and say, I, I want you to follow me. I want you to do what you're supposed to do. I don't want to. You're going to, well, I'm, you do, I'm not going to leave you alone. And he dogs after us. I really believe a true believer knows when he's in disobedience to God. You know it. You can feel it. The Holy Spirit will convict you and convict you and convict you until you get it right. Why? Because he loves you. Christ loves you. He doesn't want you to be disciplined. But he doesn't want you to go astray either. I look at the example of Jonah. He was a prophet of God. He knew that he was being in disobedience to God when he went to Tarshish. He got on a ship to get away from God. He was supposed to go the other direction. He knew when the storm came, it's God. He's after me. Oh, man, I am in disobedience. He knew it. And finally he says, okay, if I can't run away from God, I'll just die. Throw me overboard. So they threw him overboard. And God said, I'm not done with you yet. (laughs) He's got a big fish to swallow him, bring him to where he's supposed to be, and spit him on the land. said, now, are you going to go where I want you to go? Okay. And he finally went. God wouldn't give up on him. God, believe it or not, loved Jonah. And he wanted him to be faithful to him. So we know when we're not being faithful. It's not a pretty picture for a believer. Mm. But to someone who doesn't know Christ, they don't know what's happening. They're deceived. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, say, person, he don't understand what's going on. It's foolishness to him. I, you know, what, what, you probably, some of you are probably listening to me, well, what is he talking about? I wonder sometimes myself, but, but it's, it's foolishness if we are not having the Spirit of God in us to interpret what's being said. The book doesn't make sense. Wow. I'm looking at the time and I'm looking at my notes and going, we got some problems here. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. So an unsaved person doesn't understand its foolishness to them But for the believer to adopt the world's standards and way of thinking without examining it through God's word is a compromise to what God wants us to do. It's a compromise from the truth. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, which, by the way, is another name for Satan? So, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For, what are, for you are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will dwell in them. And we'll continue there in a minute. But look at that. We're opposites. Opposites. You know, they, we follow after righteousness, God's law. They're following after what they want, their own desires. We are living in the light of God's word. They don't understand God's word. They're in darkness. Christ is our master. And I hate to say this, but anybody that doesn't know Jesus as a savior, Satan's really their master. Because you're following either Christ or you're following Satan. You don't see it right away. You think, well, I'm just living for myself. (laughs) Little do you know what's going on. Where will you end up? We believe in Christ. They do not believe in Christ. Verse 16, going back to that. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
I'm owned by God. The Bible says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? Therefore glorify God in your bodies, which are his. When Jesus Christ bought me from the cross, I became his child. And I need to live for him. And I want to because of what he did for me. So we are owned by God. They're being controlled by idols. Well, I don't see anybody worshiping idols. Well, what do you call money? What do you call popularity? What do you call all the success of this world? Anything that is above God in a person's life is an idol. And that's what they are driven by, the things of this world. It's not that they're worse than us or we're better than them. No, it's just that we've been redeemed. I'm no better than an unsaved person. Only thing is, I know Christ and I'm his child. And he's offering it to everybody. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Jesus wants to give new life to us. He's bought the price. He's bought us. How much has he bought us? Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Just as a reminder. It says, Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present age according to the will of God the Father. He bought us to deliver us, to put us on the right track of where life really means something. Something that's so important. You're still with me? Okay, I, I know there's a lot here, but this is so important. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. This is what he's done for us. It says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Before Jesus Christ, I was on my way to a place called hell. But Jesus Christ brought me from that, paid for my sins, and gave me life. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Believe it or not, I, I was following after the world, which was following after Satan, it says, among whom also you once conducted yourselves in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as others. I was following the wrong path. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you're saved through faith. The Bible says that while I was still an enemy of God, he loved me and died for me. That's amazing love. That's amazing grace. And that's why I want to serve him. If he loved me that much, I got to love him for that. There's no, I have no choice, I, I say, because I'm indebted to him and what he's done for me. Only got 10 more pages. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. I will have to add, if the life we had is, was good before Christ, then Christ would not have died for us to free us from it, would he? If there was anything good in that life that I was living that could be attained or, or, or attained or straightened out, then Christ would have no need to die. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if there's any other way, please let it happen. And there wasn't. He asked God to scour heaven and earth to find a different way than be crucified. And God said, there's, son, there's no other way. And Jesus says, okay, let's do it then. I love him that much. I'm willing. Your will be done, Lord. See, there's no other way. It's what Christ has done. 417, 
This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And you're thinking to yourself, here, I cover these verses. What is he doing? I have. But let's look at it from a different point of view here. After all that we've studied, it says here in verse 18, okay, having their understanding darkened, being alienated. Alienated. Complete opposite to God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to walk all uncleanliness and greediness. Past feeling. You know, there's two choices we have. It's either God or the world. I knew of a person who was a paraplegic. He was a good friend of mine in another church. He had a diving accident and he was crippled or paralyzed from here down. He had the movement of a shoulder in his head and he was able to breathe. But everything else was dead. And he was in a wheelchair. And one day he was walk, uh, walking, he was riding his, his cart through a store and there was a sharp object on the side that ripped through his pants and sliced his leg. Didn't even know about it. And as he was rolling towards his wife, his wife sees red blood just spilling out all over the place. He had a smile on his face, didn't know anything had happened. She rushed up to him and clamped his leg and had to call 911. He was bleeding out. He hit an artery. And he didn't even know it because he was, didn't have any feeling. Well, there are people that have walking in this world who have no feeling of guilt by the sin that they do, and that's the unsaved world. And as they get deeper and deeper in that sin, they become more and more callous to God's word and to what God is saying to them. And they will spiritually bleed out until it's too late. We need to be careful that we're not that. Who being past feeling, giving themselves over to all these sins. Verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows according to the deceitful lusts. Lay aside that old. As I got down here, do what God tells you to do. Lay aside the old and then be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That next verse. See, it's not blind faith. It's the truth of God's word. It's what God's word says. We're, it's, it, we know that it's reality. We see it, what happens in Scripture. We see the example in our life. We see the example in other believers. We see what is happening in this world. It's, it's going to pieces. It's not blind faith. It's reality. And it goes on in verse 24 to put on that new man. That Holy Spirit, are you listening to what he is saying in your life? James, the uh, brother of Jesus, in his book, he's a book of black and white. He sometimes is hard to deal with and listen to because it's like so condemning. But it's the truth. You'll see that in James chapter 4, verse 4. Look at that. <laughs> he's real direct. Adulteresses, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. <laughs> kind of direct. But it's the truth. It's the truth. The Bible says you cannot serve God in the world because you're going to either hold to the one and despise the other or love the one and hate the other. We've got to make a choice as believers. First Peter chapter 4. You know, the Bible says we are in the world, but not of the world. I live here. I make a living here. I breathe and eat and do things. But I do not live like the world. That's the difference between us believers. We do not adopt their way of thinking. We've been redeemed 
We've been, our sins have been paid for. We live and interact with those of the world, but we do not act like them. We're to be a testimony of Christ's love to them. And look at this, 1 Peter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. There it is again. <laughs> okay? But be of the same mind of Christ. Be of the same mind of Christ. They hated me. They're going to hate you. Just do it. Be faithful to me. That we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. But look at this. For we have spent enough of our past time life in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness and rivalries, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Those of us that had been saved later in life, we, we waste a lot of time. Apostle Paul had, was one that had been persecuting the church. He had lived his whole life, just a, half of his life, doing the opposite of what God wanted him to do. And he says, it's, we've done enough of that. Let's do what we're supposed to do now. And let's live the rest of our life for Christ. All those things that I used to do, wasted. It was like, what did I gain from it? I look at people that are working to earn a million dollars. If I can just get it, well, nowadays that's nothing, huh? <laughs> but they, I, I'm working for a million dollars. And when they get the million dollars, are they satisfied? No. Doesn't satisfy. It's like, all that work and now I've got to watch it, and I've got to protect it, and I've got to be scared that somebody's going to steal it from me, and, and there's no peace. We need to be careful of that. Verse 4, in regard to these things, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. I like that. Flood of dissipation. I'm not sure what that is, but they, they look at you and say, why aren't you coming to the party? Why aren't you taking these drugs? Why aren't you doing what I'm doing? And they, they think it's strange because they do not see that life in Christ is so much better. And so we are to live Christ before them, to give an example to them, to let them see the love of Christ. But what happens sometimes? We get judgmental and we point fingers at them and we make them feel bad and, and they start looking at us like, what are you, who, you think you're better than I am? And sometimes we think we are. What did Christ do? He said he was the friend of sinners and publicans. He was among them. He loved them. He cared for them. He prayed for them. He hugged them. He cared about them. And people that were sinners and publicans loved him because they saw that he had compassion for them. We as believers need to be like that. Going back to the last couple of verses of Philippians as we end here. It says here, verse 20, for our citizenship is where? It's in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we're just pilgrims passing through. A good reference to that you can look at is, is read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. We're pilgrims just passing through. Our home is with Jesus Christ someday. And we'll be with him for eternity. We are from a different country, seeking the ruler from that country, giving total allegiance to him, and adopting and living by the rules of that land. As believers, that's what we are. And then verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. The Holy Spirit gives witness to us that we are changed, that a change has taken place in us that we have been transformed. It's an ultimate change that is yet to come. It's a starting of a change. 
And as Paul put it, it's not complete until we see him face to face. But there is a change there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you don't need to turn there, but if you're taking notes, 51 to 54, it's going to be a glorious day when we have no more sin to worry about, no corruption to deal with. We are like Christ. That day is coming. So basically, hang in there. Keep going. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says that we are made like Christ. We will have no more sin. We'll be transformed into his likeness. But that is what he's working on us right now to make us into the image of God. And that transforming power that takes place in us believers is so amazing and so wonderful. Sometimes it hurts. You know, squeezing me into the mold. If that piece didn't fit quite right. I'll make it fit. You know, and God works on us. But when it's all over with, it's like, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. You know, what I'm talking about here, maybe to you it doesn't make sense. Because you don't know Christ as your Savior. And I'm here to tell you that God loves you and wants you to be his child. If you've never trusted Christ, that's saying, I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sins and I trust that alone to get me to heaven. The Bible says, but as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. And the question comes, would you receive him to open up this avenue of power that God wants to give to you through the Holy Spirit? It is simply putting your faith and trust in what he did for you. It's not my works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's a gift of God. I could have here a $5 bill. And I've done this in a youth group one time. I had this $5 bill, and I says, this $5 bill I want to give as a gift. And right away, all the kids go, oh, 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 you know, they wanted it. You know, it's a gift. This is free for the taking. And I just want to give it to somebody here that's willing to take it. And they're, you know, raising their hands. And, and, you know, and finally, this one boy from the back of the room, stumbling over everybody, ran up and grabbed it out of my hand. And they go, oh, that's not fair. He took it. I said, well, he's the only one that had faith enough to come and get it. He received the $5 bill free of charge because he was willing to come and take it. The question comes, salvation is for anybody who wants to receive it. But do you have the faith enough to take it? Will you believe what Jesus did for you? As we close here and the they're coming up to lead us in another worship. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a second. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, I would like for you to stop and think, would you like to receive him? It's so simple. It's, it's not a prayer. It's not uh, doing anything for, or, or working for something. It's receiving just like you receive a gift on your birthday. This is a special birthday of eternal life that's offered to you. And the Bible says, he that believes on me has everlasting life. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? That he was buried and rose again to pay for your sins? The Bible says he did that. And if you put your faith and trust in that and say, I believe Christ died for me. I accept him as the one for my salvation. I realized that my works were not good enough. He paid it all. That's why he said it on the cross. It is finished. Now, right now, I'm going to be asking you to raise your hand. Not to get saved, but be, just encourage me that you are trusting him. And this is where the butterflies start to turn. You go, oh, man, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, that's, that, that happens, but the truth is, God loves you. Would you accept him as your Savior? Raising your hand, you say, pray for me. I'd like to receive Christ as Savior. Anybody? I'm not going to call you out or anything. It's just between you and God, and I would like to be encouraged. Anybody? I want Christ as my Savior. Well, fellow believer, I hope 
that this message is an encouragement to you, that this message here gives you hope and confidence in this crazy world that's fallen apart, to stand strong, to be faithful to him, to watch out for compromise, to be in this book. And when the book speaks to you through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are listening and doing what it says. There's where joy is. That's where peace is. That's where comfort is. What an opportunity we have to know Christ and to follow him. I'm not sure what happened to the band. We might be leaving early today. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Your word is mighty and powerful and, and active and alive. And Lord, when you speak, it's your, ver- it's your very word speaking to us. Lord, you say that your word is inspired, God-breathed, and you are speaking special words to each of us, Lord. May we hear and listen and take heed and follow your word. Lord, what a privilege it is to hold the book that was written by you and to be able to take it wherever we go and know it. Thank you that you love us, that you paid for our sins, and that we are your children forever. Amen. Such practical teaching from the Apostle Paul as he was being inspired by God on how to live the Christian life. So let's take our Bibles this week and see what we can do to apply it in our lives today. Now, if you would like to know more about our church, or you have made the decision to receive Christ as your Savior, you believe that Christ died for you and was buried and rose again to pay for your sins, and you've put your complete faith and trust in Him for that salvation, we'd like to hear from you. You can contact us by the number that is below on the screen. So till next time, be in the Word, and may God bless you and keep you in His grace.